Wayne Smith, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks, man. Looking forward to it. Yeah, we're very apprehensive. No, no, don't be. Don't be. Don't be. This is uh, this is easy compared to some of the stuff you've had to do in your career, surely. (laughs) Yeah, not easy after losses. I'll tell you that. Well, lucky it's a win. Yeah. This is going to be a win. Yeah, we're very excited to have you in the Hamilton Export Beer Garden Studio today. A bit of a change of scenery for us. Uh, Wayne, you must have had a few good nights here on Hood Street, maybe after a Chiefs Super Rugby final win or something? Yeah, um, I don't remember much of it, but after uh, we won our first title in 2012, yeah, Hood Street was the go. It's different in the cold light of day, isn't it, from a, a, heady, a heady Saturday night in Hamilton? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I'm not a big drinker, but I had a few that night. I remember um, getting a call about half past six in the morning to say, Smithy, we're at, uh, we're in the Hamilton East bar, I forget what that's called. We're in there, you need to come down. So, um, yeah, started again at about liquid half past six, bre- liquid six, breakfast. seven o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be the East Side Tavern, I imagine. No, yeah. no, no, longer, no longer there, uh, the East yeah. End. Or the Loaded Hog would have been the other one. <laughs> anyway, um, we are recording this in the middle of the Rugby World Cup. And while we're not going to talk about the games, because it'll be dated by the time it goes out, we are interested to hear about how you have been watching the World Cup. Wayne Smith watching the ABs on TV. So, so the 7 a.m. kickoffs, are you the kind of guy that wakes up at 6 and watches all of the pre-match and all the punditry? Or are you a 7 a.m., you just wake up, you switch on the TV and, and you go? I'm 3.45 a.m. Really? Yeah, I'll generally get up for the early game. Ah, of course. Yeah, okay. We've got that, we've got that All Blacks bias on. <laughs> Sit through that, um, make a cup of coffee about seven. You know the game's on at eight o'clock now. Um, get myself ready. Yeah, I like, I like watching the previews, you know. And, hey, I'm a rugby, I'm rugby through and through. Mm. I just love it. I've, I've looked forward to this. Love the fact that the French um, time zone pretty good for us, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning for the main games. So, uh, yep, I'm a tragic, sit through all of them. Do you still get nervous for the team? Not as nervous as when I'm in the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, clearly I want them to win, you know, I'm all black through and through. Um, but there's nothing that can recreate that nervous tension in the box, you know, particularly for those really big, those big matches. And especially sitting next to um, Ted, for example. You know, you often come out with bruises. I used to sit on his <laughs> left, I came out with bruises <laughs> on my right side. Uh, World Cup final in 2011, I had to get up and go to the back where the water cooler was with about 15 minutes to go because I just couldn't take any more <laughs> elbows to, to the ribs. <laughs> we were in, uh, one year we were in um, Brisbane, and you know, you've seen those big moths in Brisbane? Yeah. Um, you know, about that big? And it was a, ga- it was a really important game. Um, the, it was getting pretty close. Ted was next to me, I think he was getting a bit of a, a sweat on. And so he opened the, the window, and this moth <laughs> came and hit him first. <laughs> Fair in the face. <laughs> and he jumped up and the seat came with him. He landed on Steve Hansen's foot. So Steve gave him a punch in the ribs. <laughs> this is all the stuff you never see. Yeah, you behind never, the scenes. Behind the scenes inside the coach's box. And all the while, you know, the, the game's going on. So watching on TV, are you emotive? Like the All Blacks score a try in a big game? Are you giving a little fist pump? Are you getting up off the couch? Um, I'm getting better at that in that I'm getting a bit more emotive. Because when you're in the box you can't be mm. a mate if you know you've got a job do you're looking at what you can improve and messages you've got to give um, sitting at home my wife's pretty emotive about it um, me not so much tend to watch it um, with a, quite a bit of faith no matter what position we're in you know I've always got a bit of faith that we're going to come back and, and win the game I did wonder whether Trish watched it with you in the, in the lounge as well or whether you lock yourself off in like an office and it's only taking you and notes yeah and yeah with a notepad professor, taking yeah, it is. yeah I, I tend towards that side but I do allow her to watch it with me <laughs> but I, I don't normally like other people is that right being around yeah I don't, like I'm not sort of guy I go around and watch it with a whole group of people um, when I go to games I don't like going up to a box or anything like that to have a few beers I'd rather sit in the stand 
by myself and watch the game with a bit of nervous tension, but not, um, not too bad. You ever switch over to the ACC commentary and see what James McConey and Mike Lane's take is <laughs> on, the, on the game? Well, I, I do it cricket. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, but I've only got the, the app with, um, with you know, Sky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know if the ACC commentary is on for the rugby. Uh, on the cricket, you've got two choices yeah. on, on the app. You yeah. can watch normal one or... Yeah. Or the ACC one. Not, I wasn't aware that was on uh, in rugby. They'll take great pride in knowing that Not you're Not World Cup, though. Didn't get anyway. the World Cup rights. World Cup rights only on iHeartRadio and Radio Hodaki. There you go. All oh, nice. right. Um, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a, a niche nerd question. Are you the kind of guy that texts Fozzy good luck before a game or any of the players that you still have relationships with? Um, the odd time. I'm more likely to text them a well done Okay. afterwards. Yeah. They get, a, you know, they, they get plenty of messages for a Well, that was going to be match. my follow-up, is that when you were in that same position and your phone's getting inundated, are you the kind of guy that takes time to reply to everyone yep. as well? Yeah, I reply to everyone. It's yep. amazing. Yep. It's, um, and sometimes, you know, during the Women's World Cup, for example, you know, sometimes I'd have 150 yeah, text right. matches. Mm-hmm. Uh, test, yeah, test matches. <laughs> 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 Had those as well. <laughs> uh, text. So... Um, Takes a wee bit of time, but you know they'll cut and paste pretty good. Uh, okay, yeah. well, I wondered that. I wondered yeah, that whether yeah. it was a personal or uh, sometimes you yeah, do have to just go. Yeah, normally personal, but if you get got 150 to do, you know it's yeah. Let's go through. Dunk, 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 dunk. Never just the thumbs up. <laughs> that's, <laughs> such a dis- that's such a disrespectful <laughs> reply. Never. Yeah, Never. No, yeah. No, no, yeah no, always try. You know, always try and give a unique response. Yeah, nice. love it. So earlier this year, we had David Galbraith on the show, and. Uh, the chat with him had a really deep impact and connection with our audience. We wanted to talk about him at the top. He's a guy who looks at life differently and is someone who you've worked with uh, very closely over the years. What, in your opinion, makes DG so special? Yeah, I've been really fortunate with um, people who have helped make my career. Uh, Gilbert and Oka, a massive one obviously in the, in the same field as, as DG. DG is unique, no doubt about that. I love the, I love the smile on his face yeah. as, soon as, he, <laughs> as soon as he thinks about that. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd known him sort of um, a wee bit. I'd had a few um, sort of presentations with him um, previously to join in the Chiefs, but he, he joined the Chiefs at the same time as I did in 2012 with Dave Rennie. And I'll never forget his first presentation. Um, so he got up and he was talking to the boys and he pointed out that his office was over there and he had Hog on the front of the office, H-O-G. And he said, um, if you truly want to get better and you're serious about it, come to my office over there, habits of greatness, Hog, and uh, we'll have some conversations. And he said... But if you just want a big, bigger dick, he had, he had a, <laughs> he had a um, bucket there with a bit of rope on it and full of um, stones and said, so if you just want a bigger dick, come in there and I'll tie this to it for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, what the hell is this? Is it, what, is it stunned silence in the room with that? <laughs> was there a couple of giggles or is it just confused looks around going, who is oh, this There's an guy? eruption of laughter at that yeah, point. Yeah, good. Um, but he, he, like, he would um, give a presentation and then you'd be walking out and he'd spot like a banana skin or a, or a um, bottle of water on the ground. And who left that there? Oh, I did. Oh, um, so you want someone else to pick that up? You want someone else to fix your mistakes on the field? Is that what you're going to do? You're going to rely on other people to clean up after you? Mm. <laughs> and so very... Um, could be confrontational but it's not because it's DG mm. and he's got that way with him and, uh, and the boys know that he loves him and uh, he gets total buy-in but yeah he's he's one of life's characters he's a beautiful man I, I've got a lot of time for him I'm, I'm really I feel really privileged that he's a mate you know we can go out and play golf together and we have a hell of a hell of a lot of fun I, I love his term quintessential weirdo that yeah. he uses and he sort of loves and embraces. So we went to David. Uh, and if you haven't, get on that episode. Go, yeah, after this one, go that, listen to that one. 
when he's talking about me or <laughs> talking about talk, talk yeah. everybody. Yeah. We're, both, we're both pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> so we went to David um, to ask what his observations were of you because you've worked so closely with him over the years. And David said, rugby was always second, people were always first, and it was heart deep and authentic for Smithy. He said, the most profound memories of Smithy is that he's always first into a team meeting, sitting with his book open at the front of the room. He has an amazing and insatiable appetite for learning. He also wanted us to all learn together and started an innovation meeting on Thursdays at lunchtime where everyone in the organisation was invited and as important as each other, no ideas were silly ideas. I guess the question at, at the end of that is, were these processes and ideas, did they evolve over time? Um, we're probably we're probably all a reflection of people we meet, you know. And I, um, I had a real thirst for meeting people from diverse fields, you know, not just rugby, but um, people from um, different sports, different working environments. I read a lot of books, um, and then I was lucky enough to have the the working relationships with people like DG. You know, and so, um, and it helps change your perception over time to, um, or, or the solutions that you'd find to problems often change because of, you know, the, the people you've met. And he, he's, he's been a massive, um, latterly, since 2012, he's been a massive influence on, on my career. So we went to your son Nick to ask, you know, what his um, really? yeah. analysis was of, of Wayne and, and what his... <laughs> I, love, I, love, I, love the I love the reaction as well, it's great. How'd and, you find him? And, yeah, don't, uh, worry about, don't, worry about, don't worry about our and sources. And we got a response and we were very happy with it. And, and I'm going to read you what he said. He said, um, the thing that I think people don't get about Wayne is his insane passion and dedication to rugby. I've never seen anything like it and I think it explains his success to an extent. A story I like to tell is this one Saturday I came down to visit when I was in Auckland and he was in Cambridge. We started the day by watching our friend's son play in his under-15 game. Actually, funnily enough, it was Josh Lord. And then we decided to stay on and watch Hamilton Boys versus Rotorua Boys. We then went and watched a young prospect, who by chance was Sean Stevenson, play for his club. We made it home for the first Super Rugby game at 5.30 and then watched the next two. I decided it was time to call it a night, but Wayne stayed up to watch two European games. The thing is, in every game, he is thinking about what he calls the trends of rugby. He has an incredible appetite to digest rugby, and I find he's able to be ahead of the curve simply because he digests more rugby than anyone else. And the question I had at the end of that is, your appetite and passion for rugby, has it stayed the same through the course of your life? Well, it's almost been explained. Like in that, that situation, you recall names, dates, fields. You're an encyclopedia. It, it, Surely it must have stayed the, the course of time. Yeah, um, like I can't remember someone I met yesterday, but I can remember scores and who I coached and, yeah. you know, and um, events from rugby. And um, I grew up with that passion. You know, as I said, Pataru, um was, you know, I played all my junior rugby there, my senior rugby started there um, as a passionate rugby crew. You know, like Pataru was a powerhouse. Uh, Pateri First 15, High School First 15 were, they, they were a powerhouse. We were, um, I think Matter Matter were rated one in the country and George Simpkin was coaching them in 74. And we drew with them for the Moesker and the, and the Trickler. Yeah, trickler. We had to play at um, Morrinsville at Campbell Park because the crowds were too big. You know, and I remember someone telling me that George was so um, nervous he was standing beside, beat behind the stand having a smoke yeah. towards the end of the game. I got to school on the Monday morning having drawn eight all and I got knocked out at the end of the game. So I woke up in the changing room with um, my dad and my uncle there. I get to school on the Monday morning, no one would speak to me. And I then found out that at eight all, with like a minute left on the clock, I'd made a break from the 22, so I'd dummied and gone. And I ran all the way down the field, had a winger outside me and I must have dummied the fullback and got the old... <laughs> stiff arm yeah. so I ended up waking up in the changing room and no one speaking to me at school because yeah. I'd, I'd lost us the trickler and the and the uh, Moesker Cup but that's that's how Heartland Rugby was you know the, the small schools were strong um, 
vibrant. It was the only sport I really played. I did athletics and I played tennis and I loved all that and I played golf. But really the sport that mattered to me was rugby and I was driven to, as I say, to go as far as I could and knew I didn't have to be great to do it. I, I knew I could play a role in, oh, in great teams. I've got on reasonable authority you turned up for Kashmir Tech every now and again in, uh, in senior football though. I did, I did. Um, I worked with a guy, Terry Sullivan, who, who played for them. And uh, so towards the end of my career, I'd play for Belfast and if it was a 12 o'clock game, I'd I would sneak in a game of football for Kashmir. <laughs> Where'd you play? Anywhere near the ball. I didn't know any of the posi- positions. I just wanted to be near the ball and have a crack at it. Yeah. Have a bit the of goal. pace, you would have been uh, an attacker. Imagine that, just turn out and being like, hang on a minute. <laughs> wasn't, he, wasn't he in the Ranfurly Shield team in like 82, 83? Geez, you guys have done some research. <laughs> yeah, 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 a point of difference. Um, but back to what Nick was saying. So it's like... He talks about how much... I'm not sure how long ago the story was. Um, Josh Lord under 15s, it's pretty... But, it's yeah, pretty. it was a while ago. But in the last podcast that you did, it kind of went viral because you, you commented that you switched off a Super Rugby game at halftime to watch some sort of animal documentary. <laughs> and so be careful what you say now. But um, <laughs> was that a one... Like, because you're... Are you still frustrated by the game? Like... Is, is it, do you still love it the same way that you did then? It's coming up to Shark Week, actually, which, yeah. is, always, which is always a very, very big week in the animal kingdom. Yeah, look, I, look, I, I love the game. Um, that was one game out of probably 100 that, that I switched off. It was frustrating to me. But I think a lot of the world's getting frustrated. You know, you talk to people who watched the um, NRL final the other night, one of the great sports events of the year, wasn't it? Mm. Like a phenomenal. And um, it's just got a bit more flow. Um, I think what's made us as a country really ahead of the ball um, for 120 years is we've always been able to reinvent ourselves quicker than anyone else. Anytime there's been a law change, we've been able to adapt to it quickly and then dominate the world. Um, you know, you think back to uh, Dave Gallagher, you know, on the boat going over in 1905, he read the law book and saw that there was a, a loophole there that you could have a player play in the backs or in the forwards and they could change when they wanted to do that. And so he became a wing forward and they just obliterated every team in, in um, Europe having reinvented themselves. But Eventually, they got scouted by Wales, who decided they'd play this tactic back at the, at the All Blacks, the originals, and beat the All Blacks in that last game. And so since then, I think we've been really good at, at looking into the future and making changes before they happen. I think that's really important, and we need to continue to do that because that's in our DNA. You know, um, if you're on the... If you're sailing in the America's Cup, you're looking at the horizon, um, trying to pick up the wind changes, and then you're trying to, to have a strategy before, before you hit that wind. And I think we've got to do the same. And if you look at the game currently, there's a lot of frustration around uh, the number of penalties, the number of yellow cards, the number of rucks. We're just going straight in the ruck, there's another ruck. They'll always pick up a penalty, because there's a penalty just about every ruck if you want to see it. Then you play maybe four, five, six, seven um, phases of advantage, then you come back, then it kick to touch, then there's a, a drive, and, and so on. And I think it's frustrating a lot of people, not, not, not just people like me. And if you are in the crow's nest, it can't carry on like this, so they're going to have to make some changes. And as an example, I think one of the changes might be that they'll lower the tackle height again. And um, maybe they lower it, lower it to, I don't know, belly button height. So the intended consequence of that would be um, to save, to stop injury or dangerous injury. So it will stop head clashes. It'll need some good um, a coaching movement to teach good technique for the tackler, you know, chin up, eyes open, head to the side, strong grip drive through, all those sorts of things. But it'll make the game safer. But the unintended consequence 
will be the ability to offload. And so we're going to have to work on support players understanding probably the offload's going to come now. That'll lead to less rucks, which will lead to less penalties and less injuries. And the games will become either exhilaratingly good, as the All Blacks were against Italy, or exhilaratingly bad, like Italy were against the All Blacks. Mm -hmm. But it'll be exhilarating just the same. And so I think that's only one example, but I think the game will evolve again and we've got to be at the forefront of it. And I'd like to see a coaching movement now that teaches the skills to be able to play that sort of game when it's legislated. That, that's really interesting comment about New Zealand always being at the forefront of sort of innovation and collaboration because I feel like you have been at the heart of that across the last, I don't know, 20 30 years, whatever it's been. And it leads nicely into Nick's second point. He said, uh, one of Wayne's greatest qualities is that he is never afraid to share ideas and is not intimidated by rivals. He doesn't feel like he has to protect his ideas from them. He learns a lot from sharing ideas and having robust discussions. I really like this as I think it is a much more positive way to approach your craft. I'm an academic and I adopt a similar attitude when it comes to my ideas. Typically academia can be like coaching and that people are scared to share insights out of fear they might be stolen. Sure, on occasion I've had ideas stolen, but in the long run my ideas have improved Proved through the interaction. And from hearing other interviews, I'm wondering, does that go back to uh, what you learned from Graham Henry in the Blues in 97, where you were kind of surprised at how open he was and that sort of influenced your coaching? Yeah, I've always been curious, you know, um, about um, other sports, other successful people, um, books. You know, I love Stephen Covey's book on the Seven Habits. Um, I love John Wooden, you know, who got coach of the uh, Millennium in the States. Actually, I got a chance to have a cup of tea with John Wooden in 2007. And I was really intrigued by his um, statements that it's not how you run, it's not how you, it's not winning the race that counts, it's how you run it. And so I was round at his place, felt really privileged having it chat to him, handed him, actually we, um, there was a few of us from New Zealand Rugby, we took a framed All Black jersey and I was about to explain the All Blacks to him and he said, oh, I know who the All Blacks are, Wayne, I worked for New Zealand government in 1957 <laughs> really? or 59 or something, teaching basketball around the schools, but he couldn't find, his, his walls were just full of photos and um, gifts from people and so he couldn't find anywhere to put it so he stuck it down on the ground it was right underneath Mother Teresa's sign <laughs> photograph I thought, that's beautiful and I asked him about this um, it's not about winning the race it's how, how you run it so I asked him what he and you know, won 10 championship finals with UCLA and I asked him at that last time out what did you say to the team and I expected you know, he'd have a whiteboard and, you know, you see those movies and they mm. put X's, X's and O's and they're yeah. going, you're going to fake there and, and you're going to fake a pass and you're going to give it to him and you're going to score. And he said to me, I said exactly the same thing in each of those 10 finals in that, um, in that last time out. I said, so I asked, what was it? He said, when the final whistle goes, don't make fools of yourselves. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> How good's that? Yeah. You know, and so... Um, Those are the sorts of um, people that influenced me the most. And then Graham Henry, 97, my first year with Crusaders, big conference um, at HQ in Wellington. Graham Henry is the keynote speaker because he's won the Super Rugby title in 96. So I'm sitting there next to Frank Oliver and um, Ted's telling us all about how the Blues played every detail, you know, scrum here that we get slightly that right side up, um, nine, eight metre pass to, to, or eight passes, eight metres to number nine, he's flat, we do this, 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 this. And I'm writing everything down and so is um, Frank Oliver thinking, this is marvellous. And then they win again in 97 and so he, he um, gives another chat. Um, for, for the next year and 
I realised that what he was doing, he'd shared ideas to where they played in 96, but he was going to, to that point, and we were all going to that point. Mm -hmm. And so it was a concept of share what you've already done, and, and it forces you to, to develop your own game and to, and to keep learning and keep getting better and having new ideas coming in. And do you adopt that same method? Do you share up to where you don't share the latest things you're working on, just to kind of where you... Yeah, I'm, all, I'm always conscious of that. Um, <clears throat> after 98, when we won with Crusaders, I gave the... I had to give the speech for the 99 season. And uh, I looked down the crowd and there was Frank Oliver writing all my notes down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I tend to use that concept. I'm, I'm happy to share. Uh, depends who you're sharing with. Like mm. when you're in the All Blacks and you're, and you're um, travelling around the Super Rugby um, franchises, you share everything because you want the, – they're at the – cutting edge of the game, the super rugby coaches. You know, it's early in the year. You've All Blacks, we still got our season coming up. So you want to learn from them. And the best way to learn is to share. You get all the ideas back. And then you create a, like a, a, an Amway um, pyramid selling um, coaching movement where, you know, you're talking to the super coaches, you try and get them to work with the NPC coaches then you want the NPC coaches to work with the club coaches, you know, and, you, mm. and that's a coaching movement. And I think um, we've got to be really aware that that's a, that's a big advantage for us in this country and we've got to keep it going. Was that part of the, re the, the rationale behind like, books like Legacy coming out, which could sort of opened the world to the All Blacks environment and the Netflix doco, the all or nothing with the All Blacks as well, as kind of that shining a light on what you'd, you might not necessarily see, but you guys were already working towards kind of the next level of things? Normally, yeah. I'd say with Legacy, um, none of us really knew that that book was coming out. So it was a guy, Kerr, wasn't it? Mm, James Kerr, yeah. Yeah, James. Um, so he had been here with one of the top photographers in the world um, over the full season, um, writing the narrative for a book called Mana. And following, following the season, I was getting a few calls from James and I think Gilbert was the same and, and maybe Ted, um, getting a few calls to talk about this, talk about that. And I just assumed it was going to mana. Um, and then I got a call from New Zealand Rugby Union saying this book had come out and questioning why I was... <laughs> part of it. <laughs> why I was part of it. And so it was all news to me. Um, yeah, we, we did share a lot of um, inside information in that book. But you know what? It really forced us to, to make changes, or not to make changes so much, but to grow what we were doing. You know, and complacency is your enemy. Um, and with the All Blacks, uh, I don't know what our winning record's been like over... 120 years, but it'll be close to 80%. And so um, you can, you have to um, absorb a loss. And again, um, you don't like it, but you've got to tolerate it and you've got to learn from it. But the biggest issue, I think, when you're coaching All Blacks is to not let winning be your enemy. You know, um, complacency is the worst thing you can have in a team. And, um, you know, that you've got to get rid of that illusion that um, everything's going well and um, you're all on target. You know, you, you need... Uh, Pat, Pat Riley, um, great NBA coach, he used a term... Um, something like um, useful worry or mm. something like that, positive worry, so that you go into a game um, with edge not quite sure, um, knowing you've got to put everything into it to, to win the game and to perform. And um, I think that's something that the All Blacks do, do pretty well. You, you watch them, um, even, even the last couple of years when there's been a bit of up and down, when it's really counted, like the, the game in Joburg, the All Blacks are fronted 
and they fronted for their coach and they fronted for, for the jersey, you know, and it was a brilliant performance. Um, so those are some of the, I think, some of the challenges that you have as a coach and the challenges of sharing. <laughs> Yeah. Just, you know, just you, on sharing. You've got to be a bit careful at times. Yeah, and just on just on that note, so you've obviously been privy to some amazing people and have audiences with amazing people. Do you get inundated with requests from people on their way up as well to have some of your time and to gain some of your knowledge? Yeah, I, I do a lot of mentoring. Um, I do quite a few of these things as well. And I'm, like, I'm happy to share it. Like, most of the stuff I share now is in the past. Like I've got a book coming out um, I've got a launch tomorrow down at my Belfast, Belfast Club and I share a lot on that um, because I wanted to have some coaching information in there but it's it's retrospective like the game's growing, it's changing I've got some stuff in there about the women and um, how we how we adapted to play that game that we played um, NZR are aware of this? <laughs> yep. Don't, don't, don't want another legacy situation here. <laughs> <laughs> this is my book, this one. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I talk, I also do a chapter on, um, on the Chiefs. The Chiefs are really special and unique. And we used the settlement by Tainui, we used the language to change the game, to change the way, the imagery that we had around the game, the... The words we used weren't rugby terms, they were to do with um, our legacy here, our history. Um, we travelled the region, we do all that sort of stuff and I tell that story. But that was back in 2012, mm. you know, and it's, it'll be interesting but it's not really applicable today. Yeah. So um, no, I'm pretty comfortable that um, you, you, you share today because tomorrow other people are going to have different ideas. We've spoken a lot about rugby, but like DG said, people first. Um, and if you're open to it, keen to talk about your other son, uh, Joshua, who's in his 30s now and has lived and does live with cerebral palsy. I'm really interested in how that ride, that journey has changed you as a yep. man and as a dad. Actually, he's with us at the moment. So he's coming down to the book launch. He's just finished his, he's just handed in his master's in American history, um, focusing on President Lincoln. Um, he's, yeah, he's living in Waihee Beach now, just down the road from us. Uh, happy as, loves the beach life. Uh, but it hasn't been easy for him, particularly being a twin. Yeah, he's, he's Nick's twin. And um, sometimes as, as a little kid, he'd ask why he wasn't named Nick. You know, so that so he could be like Nick and mm -hmm. Nick could have been Josh. Um, so it hasn't been easy for him, um, but he's done incredibly well. And it drove me to get involved with other cerebral palsy kids. And so through that, um, I became patron of Conductive Education, who deal primarily with cerebral palsy um, sufferers, but um, anyone with um, disabilities, they'll, they'll take into that unit, they've got units at schools around the country. I started at the one in um, Addington, uh, Addington Primary. And so over the years, I've been a big part of that. I'm now a life member. Um, some of the girls that I coached last year are now on the board of Conductive Education, three of them, the, the Bremner Sisters and Kendra Coxedge, are now on the board through some visits that we did. This is what they're like, outstanding. Um, yeah, so it, it probably changed our lives as much as Josh's, Josh's you know, bringing them up. Well, I wanted to ask that because it's not been easy for, for Josh. How was it for you? Yeah, um, actually he's, um, next week he's got to go, he, he gets a disability benefit while he's studying. He's got to go in and prove that he's still got cerebral palsy to, to get the benefit. Wow. <laughs> I think some people don't realise it's a condition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, things like when he first started university, he would have been 24, 25. He'd been working for me at Northampton as an analyst, a rugby analyst, very sharp on the game. Um, so is Nick, 
um, where they're both growing up with the game. They've been great scouts for me and the teams that I've been with over the years. Um, so he was working as, a, um, yeah, as an analyst for me. We came back. He was thinking about university, but he didn't have the confidence to go. He said to me one day, um, no, I don't think I'll go because I, I think I'm handicapped. And I said, why is that? Well, he said, you know, with my cerebral palsy, it's a, um, it's a disability. I, I don't think I'll be able to go. And I said, well, if you were mentally impaired, um, like you think you are, you wouldn't know that you're mentally impaired. Mm. So I think you should go to university. I think you've got the ability to do that. So he went the first year... I had, we had a lot of people helping him. Gilbert Anoka was pushing him and had a guy, Mark Sayers from Australia, who was our, um, one of our coaches with uh, All Blacks and with Crusaders, actually, and um, a, a skills-type coach. He's a professor. He was pushing Josh to go. So eventually we got him along to do a cultural year, so he didn't have to do any um, exams or essays just to see if he could understand it. And he could. And so he was about 24, 25, I suppose, at the time. Then he decided to do a, a full year, walked out of his first exam without writing anything down, traumatised, but he passed the course because his essays were so good. And then he just grew confidence and then, you know, he became an A student. Now he's finished a master's. Um, that mark will come through over the next few weeks. And if it's good enough, he'll, he'll do a doctorate like his brother. Um, but it hasn't been, hasn't been easy. It's, it's been good. It's actually been good for my coaching because um, he, was, he was very much um, a pessimist in terms of, no, I don't think I can do this. Um, so I read a book by Seligman who did 40 years of study at Penn State University on um, a state called helplessness and, and looking at pessimists as opposed to optimists and following them all through their life. A wee bit like that, Dunedin study um, and proved that A, you could learn optimism and B, the learned optimists and the optimists were more successful generally in life than pessimists. So I took some of these techniques and I worked on them with Josh about being, disputing that he couldn't do something, you know, you get a, if you got a poor mark for, for an essay or an assignment, um, it would be because he had, a, he had read the quest, question wrong or he had a different idea to the lecturer about the subject, but didn't mean he couldn't do it. He'd done, he's done it before and he can do it again. So that sort of mindset. And it's something I've used in my coaching for, for years now, is to teach learned optimism. That must have come in handy. In 2018, you came out with a cancer diagnosis. Um, optimism and learned optimism around that and how things are going to work out must have been important as well? Yep. Yep. I'm like everyone, I, I'd, uh, um, I was through a, a plane and a coaching career, I had to know that I could do what I was trying to do and that I was good at it. And when I had failures, you just got to sit yourself down and, and say, well, I've done it before. Every dog has his day. My day's going to be next week and just get back into it. Or Steve Hansen would say, have a lie down, son, and get up when you've got a better idea. Mm. You know, and, um, that's, how we, that's how we operate. And so, um, yeah, it's been really useful technique for me and, and for others that have taken it on board when I've been teaching it. I, um, coaches and I, at, when I was at Kobe, we created a, a program called Flourish um, to try and create a bit more grit and resilience in the players, you know, and it came about through some of the mental health issues that are arising today. Um, and pe people like Seligman and um, Covey played a big part in that for me, for, for coming up with that program. So I used a lot of their ideas. And it's not something that we present to a team. It's something you just do, like gratitude things, how to get in the community and help kids get to school or go and talk to kids about um, bullying and family violence and how to stand up for your mates. And the girls are particularly 
um, the black ferns are particularly connected to community um, causes and we did a lot of stuff prior to and during the World Cup and um, you know, we took food parcels around, we went to an I Have a Dream um, after school program in Tikipunga, um, Whangarei, all sorts of things. And I think that, build, that, that, that builds gratitude in you which then makes you more resilient to things. Mm gives you positive emotions, which are important, obviously. Um, yeah, so I think it's a, again, if you're looking into the future, I think it's going to be something that every high-performing coach is going to have to put in place, something like that. Across all your years, have you noticed, in general, a decline, maybe, in, in athletes coming through in some of those areas of resilience? Um, it's more overt, I think yeah, it's more obvious. Yeah, you're more likely to have a conversation with someone than you would would have back in my day. Back in my day, it would have been considered mm. you know, keep it inside. Doesn't mean it wasn't there, but you don't show it to anyone. Whereas today, I, I don't think there's that. It's it's not like that. I don't think it's certainly not like that in the women's game. They're um, they're happy to get it out. To um, have a cry and have a hug, and I think that's really, um, really healthy to, yeah. to help them get through some tough times. When um, when I started with the Black Ferns, I found the uh, the selection meetings quite difficult because with the boys, it's you know, my experience has basically been: look, you're not you're not playing this week. This is why you have a look at a couple of clips. Yeah, all good, Smithy off they'd go but you don't know really you know what they're thinking or how they're feeling inside not often anyway with the women you you know so you'd go around the hubs I'd, I'd always have another coach with me we'd go around the hubs um, and the other coaches helped in the areas as well like down in Canterbury and Wellington if I couldn't get there um, and you'd have a, a decent meeting with them and it would be half an hour to 40 minutes. You'd go through a few clips. They'd have some clips of what they're doing to get better, what they're good at, what they're doing to get better. Um, there'd often be tears. Um, sometimes I'd get a call a couple of days later to say, could I go back? Normally I couldn't go back, but I'd open up my um, Zoom for like a couple of hours, two and a half hours probably, give a whole lot of 10 minute send out on WhatsApp 10 minute um, mm. periods for, for them to come on. And I'd just let them vent. And I'd just sit there like this and yep, and I understand, yep, totally understand that. And then at the end they'd go, oh, that was bloody great, Smithy. <laughs> and off they go and then another <laughs> one would come on. Anything. You know, and yeah. this is over like a week and at, at first I was a bit traumatised myself by it. Yeah, because what do you do, what do you do with that? Yeah, you just got to handle it, I suppose. Um, I'm pretty resilient, but yeah, I, I felt, you know, sometimes I'd say, can you come back, Smithy? And I'd go to Trisha, I'm not, I'm not bloody going back there. Like, you know, I've got to have my own recovery. Um, and the Zoom part was, was really good. Um, and by the end of the World Cup, I was pretty certain inside that it was the way to go, that that's what we need to do. We need to put more time into caring for them during that period, because you know, missing out's a big thing. And um, so I think the way we did it may be a blueprint for the future. Is there still room though for some old school values? Like, How do you blend the, the two worlds? Um, I don't really know what I mean by old school values, Like, but it just, yeah. Yeah, generally I, I think um, the people I coach generally come through with pretty good values, you know, to, to reach the level that you're coaching at, whether it's Black Ferns or Super Rugby or All Blacks. Um, they generally all have great family support. Um, no matter what their background has been, they'll always have whānau around them to support them. Uh, most of them have good partners. With the women, you know, they, they will work up until now. The, the game's been monetised a bit more now and there's more professionalism, but generally they, they've all done degrees, work, you know, Ruhe de Mont's, um, admitted to the bar 
as a lawyer, so is Grace Steinmetz. You've got teachers like um, the Bremner girls, um, you know. Um, and for them, um, it's, it's a joy to play a test match. It's exciting. Uh, they've had to work hard to get there. They've got supportive family, supportive partners. Um, very few nerves, more going out there with a, la- with a smile on their face and into it, you know. Um, so probably a wee bit like we were back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, b- before the game went professional. Um, you, you've made it. It's been hard getting there and you're going you're gonna to make the most of it. Um, yeah, and, and, and so there is a difference between the men's and the women's game. Um, but, you know, it's um, the women, women's game's developing and eventually there'll be professional athletes come through like the men, I suppose. The challenge will be, um, with all professional sporters, is to retain the love of the game, you know, and, and, to, and to remember that it is a game and that it's supposed to be fun and you've got to build a lot of fun into your week, I, I reckon. We're going to talk more about the Black Ferns a little bit later, but you mentioned about how resilient you are, and that is built from the adversity that you've been through. If people are probably aware of the successes you've had, Super Rugby Championships, the World Cups you've won, but the adversity there, like um, getting sacked as All Blacks coach, when you think back on that now, uh, are you the kind of guy that thinks that you learn more from your failures than your successes? Like, How do you reflect on, on what, that, what happened there? Yeah, the, the challenge is to learn from both. Um, yeah, I'm the, I think I'm the only All Black coach to get sacked. Is that right? Did you get sacked? Yeah. I got sacked twice. And you can read about that in my book because no one knows about the second time. Good tease, really good tease, really good tease. <laughs> yeah, and then <laughs> uh, probably should have got sacked the third time. You know, in 2007, we were right. pretty close to getting sacked. Um, yeah, like... 2001 was interesting because we had lost the previous year in 2000. We had all the trophies won, you know, at um, about six minutes into injury time at the stadium in Wellington. Yeah. And it came over from um, the referee that next time out, the game's over. And the, the players clearly heard it because we nearly scored in the corner and we were up by two points. We'd beaten them in Sydney, we'd beaten the box. Um, trophies are down there. Tony Gilbert and I start w- walking down the st- steps to pick them up. Um, Larkham, there's a long 22 dropout. Tana lets it run into touch because next time out it's over and we've got to play the line out. And so it took everyone by surprise. And that's history now, but we lost the line out. Dowdy tried to win the ball back at the ruck, came in from the side. Um, the Wallaby uh, kicker was off the field, still in Mortlock, so Eel stood up. It wasn't a hard kick, but it was an easy one, and he nailed it. By the way, I'd love to run your commentary <laughs> with the actual incident and see how accurate <laughs> it was, because I feel like it's, it's play-by-play accurate there. Play-by-play, man. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, so we're halfway down the stairs and all of a sudden he's having a kick for goal and we lose by a point. Following year, very similar. Last game against the Wallabies in Australia, I think we're up by maybe four points. Going into the last minute, we get a penalty. Mertz kicks for touchdown into their 22. Um, in those days, of course, the referees ruled the time, so you're never quite sure whether it's full time or not. Well, this one went on. We lost that line out um, down in there. We were, so we are in attack down there, 22. Is that all of the Might have been. I'm trying to compete with, like, yeah, <laughs> with yeah, like, the authority on world rugby. What an idiot. <laughs> and then um, the game just kept going and going and going, and I'm thinking, oh, this is like deja vu. Or would Yogi Berra say, like, deja vu all over, all over again? again. <laughs> yeah. I just kept going and going and going. There's a couple more quick line-outs, and Aussie are just attacking, 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 and finally Kefi scores right under the sticks, and they convert it to win. And um, it was devastating. You know, and so I come back, come back to um, Christchurch. 
I get a call from Anton Oliver, who's coach, about a week later. How you going? I said, well, I haven't been out of the house. I was building a rill. Do you know what a rill is? It's no. like a little canal. I was building one in the backyard, yeah. which Trish wasn't very happy with, but I didn't know what else to do because <laughs> I wanted something to do. So I was digging holes and I was bricking, <laughs> bricking it. And, and, and Anton said, look, I haven't been out either. I haven't even been out to the supermarket. So he hopped in his car and he came up. And um, Norm Maxwell and a couple of others came around and we sort of just sit in there with a thousand island, a thousand mile steer. I said, this is ridiculous, boys. We, should we go down and have a beer down at the local? So we got down to the Papua Nui Tavern. I went there because it's mainly a rugby league mm. pub and I thought they won't, they won't know who we are. So we go in there. Well, this bloke comes straight up to the bar, buys us a beer. Turns to Anton, he said, because hey, Anton had thrown the ball into the line out. <laughs> uh, Indication. Yeah. I got it. I got yeah, it right. Got it well right. done, mate. And he said, hey, Anton, um, I heard you threw yourself under a bus, but you missed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it started the evening. It was, you know, it got us back into life. Yeah. Because yeah. you can, you know, you can feel like everything's against you. I then had a, so 11 days after that result, I had to go to Wellington for a review. And I'd had a review from the players and staff and NZR and whatnot. And my contract could have continued. So I still had an existing contract just for a couple of months. Could have continued and I could have gone on to the next year. But um, I was questioning myself, wasn't sure. I had the support of the union for a start, or the people. Um, and I wanted to be certain that everyone knew that I was taking responsibility just like the players have to. So um, the interview panel was made up of some of the great men of New Zealand rugby history. You know, I'm talking about Brian Lahore, DJ Graham, those sorts of people, Lane Penn was there. Um, Andy Dalton, I think Andy Dalton was there. They were great men anyway. And, but when I look back, I think they were all of the same, they were all the same type of men, um, similar views. And I don't think they could understand why I was questioning myself. I was all black coach. Firstly, why can't you beat Aussie and, and why, why are you questioning yourself? And so um, I decided to reapply for the job rather than have it rolled over. And I wanted to know that I could go through an interview and get the job again. And that would have given me confidence that I had support and I could have gone ahead. But it soon became obvious I didn't have support. Yeah. <laughs> so I went, to the, I went to the interview, missed out on the job. Um, I was actually, um, Trish and I were with really great friends, Mark and Janet Vincent, up in the Mount. I wanted to get away. We were up at the Mount. Um, we were heading to a winery, actually, and the phone went, and it was Dave Rutherford, the chief executive. Um, so I pulled, pulled the car over and um, answered the phone, and he told me that I'd missed, missed the job. Um, so I just sort of sat there. But I had my great mates in the car and Trish. So we thought, oh, we'll, we'll keep going to the winery. We didn't eat much for lunch. <laughs> we had a fair, fair bit of wine. Um, and then they went through the process of, of naming the next coach and so on. So it was a pretty difficult time. Um, but I was the architect of that, you know, and, and um, I'm, st I'm still aware of that. There's, there is a story following that in the book that took me somewhat by surprise, an action by the union following that, but you'll have to read that. He's teasing it well, yeah. he's teasing this book well. <laughs> um, and that shocked me a bit. Um, but you know, I look back and it gave me an opportunity to, to go overseas and get some experience. Became head coach of Northampton. Um, loved it there, absolutely loved it. Had a, had a great team, great, um, just, uh, able to work in a really professional environment. 
Um, just, when, so when, so sorry, just before we move on to Northampton, I've heard you say that if you had internalised those thoughts instead of speaking them, you still would have been the All Blacks coach. Do, so do you look back with regret of the way that you handled not it? Not now. I probably did at the time. I was thinking, damn, why did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted the players to understand that I took responsibility as well as them, you know, and, and the outcome for them if if they haven't played well is to get dropped, you know. And um, I actually I actually took um, or sent a book to quite a few of the leaders in that team. It was Lloyd Jones's book, The Book of Fame. If you haven't read it, if you're a rugby fan, you haven't read that The Book of Fame. You should do. I was going to ask at the end of the episode for some book recommendations. So. Yeah, so it's about 19... It's a novel on the 1905 All Blacks. And um, I wanted the players to read it and just put a wee note in um, that I was responsible like, like they were and basically the consequence was this, that I, I was gone. Um, but, you know, we were early in the professional era... Um, there were two of us, so it was myself and Tony Gilbert, that was us. Um, had uh, the Colonel, Andrew Martin, came on board, um, and he's a workaholic, and so he, he was a great help. And I had a, a girl called, a, a woman called Kelly Hyde as my PA who was outstanding. And she would often have a phone in that hand, typing in that hand and talking to a customer coming into the office that we shared. Um, but that was us, and Gilbert and Oka um, joined and was a huge support for Tony and I, but it's the bones of what you'd have today. Mm. Like, yeah. and, and having to handle, it was overwhelming for me, coming from Crusaders um, with, a, with an office behind you, um, being sort of, by myself in Christchurch was difficult. You've got, you know, media, you've got um, commercial obligations, you got strategic planning, you know, I was doing everything. And it was a tough, tough job. So going to, um, so leaving in 2001 was, was, yeah, I was regretful, but it gave me an opportunity to work in a professional, really professional environment with other coaches um, so I headed that campaign. And I was I was on the board. I, I went to board meetings, so I had some influence there. Um, had great players coming through. Made a couple of finals at Twickenham. We lost both of them. And I think that was good for me in terms of learning resilience again. Yeah, you, you know, standing out in the middle, in front of eighty-five thousand. Our the owner of our club had put on one hundred and twenty buses for people to come down to Twickenham, and you're yeah, picking up the silver medal. It's a real dose of reality to you, you know. How, how does that adversity of 2001 compare with 2007? Because that is the other, what I imagine, low moment where, you know, All Blacks get knocked yeah. out of the quarter final. You're obviously, you know, a, a big role in that team. And I hear you say that you learned who your real friends were at that time. Yeah, yeah no doubt about that. Um, yes, yeah, so in 2004 at Northampton, I got a call from. Graham Henry, who's applying for the All Black job, and he wanted to know if I would come back to work with him if he got the job. And initially, my answer was no. So Trish definitely didn't want to come back. My boys, they held a bit of a grudge, the boys and Trish. They didn't want anything to do with New Zealand rugby. So I'm on the phone, and they're running up the stairs going, no. <laughs> no dear. So I said to... Um, Ted, look, I'm not sure about running back in a week. I had a lot of... I wanted to meet with the Northampton people when I talked to Trish and the boys. So he rang me back um, on the Saturday, actually, a week later, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to come back. But then other people started ringing. I remember having a conversation with Gilbert and Oka, um, Steve Hansen, who was going to go, who decided he would go back with Graham. And I sort of knew deep down inside that I needed to go just for myself. I had to prove to myself that I had what it took to go back in that environment and prove myself. And I didn't want to be thought of as a failure um, like I was. I wanted to I wanted to show you that I had that resilience. And so leading into 2007, yep, 
that was a tough, that was a tough, tough time, as you can imagine. Probably the worst day in my life, other than deaths in the family, would be landing in Tokyo, coming back after the quarterfinal and seeing all the tour groups heading over to watch us play in the semi final. Oh, now that wow. was, yeah, that was, for someone like me, that was really tough. Um, get home and, yeah, difficult time because Rob, Rob's good mate of mine, Robbie Dean's been my manager in the, in the Crusaders, took over Crusaders. Um, and for him to miss out on the job in 2007 was seen as unfair in Canterbury. And like he's Canterbury's son. So, yeah, it was difficult. It was difficult living there. I found it like that anyway, because I like um, I sense that sort of stuff, you know. And I, I want I want people to talk to me and to connect. But there's a lot of people looking the other way. Mm. You know, I spoke at a, I had to speak at a couple of clubs. We were we weren't ordered to go around the clubs, but we felt we should go and and talk. And that was difficult. Specifically um, about the Rugby World Cup. Well, it always came to that. <laughs> yeah. I spoke at one club and um, Shadbolt spoke before me. I don't know if you've ever heard him speak. Tim, Tim Shadbolt. Tim Shadbolt. Yeah. But he's the wittiest, funniest, most accomplished speaker I've ever seen. He spoke before me and had the, had the club in an uproar, you know, of laughter. And then I got to go speak. You know, so they were pretty difficult times. Um, How many pints at the Papua New Guinea Tavern in that rugby league uh, spot? Or oh, not we had even, a few. Not even there. No, we had a few, we had a few in there. It, it calmed your nerves a wee bit and um, brought you back into community. You know, you can't you can't hide away. You, you've got to be out there. But yeah, no, I've made I haven't hidden the fact that they were pretty difficult years, 2007 through to 2011. Um, you know, from 2004 to 2011. We won 89 tests out of 103, but we were still ratchet because we didn't win a World yeah. Cup. And it wasn't till I'd never felt that we we got um, people on side until we thrashed France 8-7 in that final. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I remember going to the press conference and all of a sudden the mood had changed. Yeah. You know, from being... No, we'd won, we won Grand Slams in 2005, 2008, 2010. We never lost a game in, on a European tour, other than the World Cup quarterfinal. But European tour, we never lost a game. We'd never lost to Bledisloe, and we'd won most of the Tri Nations. Yet we were hopeless because we won a World Cup, and it changed in an instant at the end of that game. And I remember walking back into the changing room at Eden Park um, from having a positive press conference which was unusual for us walking back into the changing room and there was John Key drinking out of the cup yeah. and I thought how hey, the world's changed yeah. <laughs> there's a lot in that 2011 I'm keen to dig around in resilience has been a, a word and a theme we've talked about a lot you had front row seats to watching what Richie McCaw did at that tournament moon boot on during the week got himself up and played like was that that must have been just incredible to witness the the strength of the man. Yeah, um, there could not have been a more difficult set of scenarios for us than that tournament, I reckon. Um, so it's the Richie thing, clearly. Now that's superhuman, isn't it? Uh, I don't know anyone else who could have done that mm. because he was in pain. You know, it wasn't it wasn't just to protect his foot; he was in pain as well. And to get that thing off, train Thursday. Um, play Saturday, back in the moon boot Sunday and still play like he did, I think is just phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, we had the DC um, injury before the Canada game. I'll never forget that because I'd taken over as kicking coach because Mick Byrne was with um, Japan. And so after the final training... Um, DC decided he wanted a few kicks and he shanked, he shanked the first one. So I'm behind the post and he shanked. I've never seen him shank a kick in his life. Mm -hmm. And then he shanked the second one. Oh, that was a bit strange. And then the third one, bang, he went down with that ripped 
groin. At the start, I wondered if he was having me on. And I sort of looked at him, and then I saw Conrad Smith go over and look down and go, oh, like that. And, um, yeah, it was like that. Just that feeling at that time was devastating. So we go into the changing rooms, and Ted picked everyone up. He stood up in front of the group and he said, boys, we're going to win the World Cup. Nothing's going to change. But we all know how big a part of it Daniel is, but he's going to stay a part of it. But we're going to win the World Cup. And it just created a real positive us against them attitude. And then there are other things took place, you know. The, that, um, that, that happens publicly when you're talking to the team. Privately, yeah. as the coaching group getting together and going, fucking hell, what are we, what are <laughs> we going to do here? Fucking like, are you starting to think straight away as soon as you realise he's out? Okay. Like, is that your job? Well, I can tell you about the, the next coaching meeting we had. Um, it's been well documented, but we're sitting there wondering who we can bring in. You know, um, there's, so DC's out. Um, we've got um, Colin Slade out now. We've got Creedon come in. But who are we going to bring in? We thought of every first five in the country. <laughs> And they're all either overseas or injured. And then Mills Molina passed by the door and um, Ted ran out and said, Millsy, is, um, is Beaver in Bath yet or is he still in the country? And Mills said, oh, I'll find out, Ted. So he rang, I think he rang Beaver's girlfriend, couldn't get hold of Beaver, who got hold of Stephen. And then he rang and we're in the middle of the meeting and... And so um, he rings Ted and Ted goes, oh, what are you doing, Beaver? And he said, oh, I'm white baiting, you know, down the Waikato. And um, so you, you caught much, Beaver? And he goes, you got a couple of pound, Ted? And Ted said, that's a shitload of white bait, Beaver. He said, if you bring that to room 424 <laughs> at the Heritage, you can play in the World Cup final. <laughs> That's how it happened. Incredible story. They should make a movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they were difficult times. We had that incident. We, we hook up with um, Cora Jane and... And, and Izzy, eh? Izzy. Um, and, you know, Mills had been capped 100 games. One of the greatest players we ever coached, Mills Molina. And, um, and he was injured. Um, got injured, so... Um, we needed, we needed those two to be at their best. And I'll never forget this because neither of the, they, they smart guys, they were, they were heroes of that World Cup, um, played brilliantly. I thought those two and, and um, Richard Kahui for three weeks were probably the best players in the world. But they needed to do something. Um, you know, Corey and Corey Jane and, and Israel Dag to make up for an evening out. Mm. And instead of apologise to the team, I still remember this, Corey Jane was playing in the quarterfinal, Izzy had an injury so he couldn't play. Um, but Corey got up in front of the team, didn't apologise, he said, I'm going to get player of the match in the quarterfinal. Yeah, he can't do better than that. And that's what he did. And that's what he got. And as, as he did the same for the semi-final, I'm going to be the best player on the field in the semi-final, which he was. And you just look back and think, you know, apologies and that to teams are, um, you know, not that sincere. You go out and make a statement like that and you, and you do it, that means a lot to the team. So um, they're all pinnacle events in, in us winning that. There's a lot of, a lot of adversity in that campaign but um, yeah there's a lot of desire as well and I'd, I'd heard you say in interviews that after that that it was the highlight of your career it would be very hard to beat but there is one which I think <laughs> did be that coming down the line but before we get to that I've heard you also say that Graham Henry is the best analyst that you've worked with or in world rugby like what is it specifically about his eye like what, why is he such a good analyst does he watch more rugby than you um Probably about the same, but we watch it at different times. So I always worked late at night. So I'd work till maybe 11 o'clock, half past 11. And on match day, 
I'd normally do my first bit of coding until about two in the morning. And if Trish was with me, she'd have she'd be reading a magazine or something, having a gra- glass of white wine. I'd have a glass of red wine while I'm doing my first coding just to get on top of it. He does all his, he starts early in the morning, half past four. And then we'd, we'd end up at breakfast and he'd say, did you see what um, England did against Ireland? And I would have seen it the night before. And he's just seen it then. And we'd have the same discussion, we'd seen the same thing. Um, but he's, yeah, he's a step ahead. Are the rest like, of the staff sitting around the table going, have a day off, you two? <laughs> <laughs> Play yeah, some cards or something, <laughs> Jesus. Nah, they're all hard workers. Is that right? Oh, man, this, uh, all black staff are hard workers. You know, Pete Gallagher, George Duncan, Gilbert, um, the Doc, you know, Gilly, the S&C. Man, they work hard. It's a really, it's a working environment that really pushes the boundaries you know, of um, of fatigue and, you know, you're under pressure all the time, but it's beautiful. But it's a great. beautiful coming together of, of totally committed people all after the same thing and all prepared to dedicate their lives to it and with families that support them to do it. It's, it's an amazing environment. I want to jump on that family point really quickly because how important is Trish, it's a two-parter, one to Wayne Smith, the man, and two, Wayne Smith, the coach, can you separate her role across those two areas? Um, no, she, she would say that Wayne Smith, the man, is a coach. Uh, she often says we've been together 41 years, but really only 20 of them, because <laughs> <laughs> I've been away so much. Um, yeah, that support's really critical and support of the, my boys have been really supportive. And as I say, helpful as scouts, they're, they've got a good eye for the game, both of them. Um, they put, like, for, as an example, when I was at Chiefs, they put me on to Anton Leonard Brown. And um, you have to read that story in the book as well. Here we go. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, I've had huge support from them, obviously, but also um, the rest of my family, you know, mum and dad, my sister Wendy and her, husband Rod, Rod's like my brother. Um, they've always been supportive and driven me to, you know, where I've got to. Um, Trisha's side of the family the same. Her mum lived with us um, for years. And yeah, um, I always felt I had loving support to do what I loved doing and that was coaching. Such is the depth of the Wayne Smith story that we're going to brush past the other World Cup win you had in 2015 <laughs> just because I'm a bit weary of time and I want to give the Ferns story uh, what it's worth. But sort of take us to, what, two days before you'd applied for the pension and then all of a sudden you're appointed as the Black Ferns coach. The conversation with Trish, are you saying, hey, going um, on again. you know how I went for the pension uh, two days ago? Actually, I'm now head coach of the Women's World Cup team. Um, uh, she was totally supportive. Pro- uh, I actually got home after that first week and I was buggered. Like, I hadn't coached for a while. I took every session. Um, unfortunately, people had resigned when that mental health report came out and um, I was sort of stuck in the middle with Wes Clark, Whitney Hanson, who'd been a one-day-a-week intern, um, Glenn Moore, who'd been the head coach, uh, it was really hard on Glenn. He's a good mate. Um, it was really difficult on him. So I got home after that first week. I could hardly speak. I had laryngitis. You know, I'd taken all these sessions. I'd been pushing the girls. And, um, you know, I'd made a statement to him, we're going to win. We're going to win the World Cup at Eden Park in front of 40,000. But we're not going to win it today. We've got, we've got a lot of work to do. And so they bought into the game we wanted to play and the skills that they needed to play that game. So we started early. Um, but I got home that first week, I said to Trish, I was starting to feel, I don't reckon I can do this. Like, um, it was just so hard. And she put her arm around my neck and gave me a hug and said, you got to do it. Like, it's too late for anyone else, you've, you've got to do it. So, yep. So I thought, right, I've got to steal up here and um, managed to get Mike Cron, my old mate Mike Cron on board. Scrum doctor. Who's, yep, more than that, way more than a scrum doctor. 
Mike Cron, just a brilliant coach. I think best in the world. Won two World Cups with him, with the men, and now one with the women. Um, and he was the ideal mentor for Whitney. So Whitney was made head forward coach, um, and Crono was her mentor, but you got the best coach in the world mentoring a woman with huge potential, you know, so um, that balanced out well. Had Wes, Wes Clark, who I'd been working with for quite a few years before that anyway as a mentor. He was the defence coach, and um, I fought hard to get Alan Bunting in. I'd heard a lot about Alan Bunting as a... Um, in terms of culture and leadership that he creates in the sevens, he had a huge success, loved by the girls, Olympic gold, multiple World Cups. So I was working with New Zealand Rugby to see if I could get him in to run the culture and leadership side because it was taking its toll on me. I, like it was, I was under the pump. Um, I was working with the leaders on a concept and I needed someone to run it. So luckily, Bunce was able to come in can I just say, a long way from second year university at University of Waikato, Alan Bunting, to who he is now. Yeah. Like that progression as a, as a man is incredible. It's not that I claim to know him very well, but I just remember the dreadlock guy yeah, yeah. who was kind of on the fringe of the seventh circuit to see who he is and what he's doing now is an incredible yeah. progression. Yeah, and he tells that story too because he had some tough years like we've all had, you know, when we're younger, doing things we shouldn't do. Um, and that's what makes him... Um, a great human in, in that environment. So he and I worked really well together. Um, you know, initially, initially we were going to base everything on a waka and we designed these ideas. We were having a chat one day with a leadership group and decided we're not actually going anywhere, so we don't need a waka. <laughs> um, and we decided let's, let's use our furry. So let's base everything on our furry and what does that mean? So who are we? What's our identity? Let's everyone tell us about their whare. And so we started a process, Te Whare Tapafa, where everyone had to, um, had to present to the team at some point about where they'd come from, who they were, what was their upbringing was like, what their purpose is, what their strengths are, what do they need to work on, you know, all that sort of stuff, who their mentors are. What, what was your, just pause it, what was your te ao Māori knowledge before your rugby journey? Um, my te rā ma- Māori knowledge comes from Pataru, that's about it. Eho, we called each other Eho. Yeah. Um, you know, I know a lot of words, Tauranga Puka and all that, because you use them in everyday language in Pataru. I'm going to study it, I think, at some point. It's very, the same vowel sounds as Italian. Yeah. And I speak Italian, so hopefully I'll be able to pick it up. But, but yeah. even, the, even the concepts of, of Māori and Māori, like they seem to be really strong through your coaching now. Is that something that you've picked up along the way? Yeah, I think, um, well, obviously coming from where I came from, but also the Chief's experience, um, the, the looking at the history, um, known intimately um, about the settlement by Tainui and and having um, followed what where they went. We, we followed their trail um, we united the region. So, yeah, um, I have had some experience in it, but I wouldn't say I'm, I'm anywhere near a, um, an expert in it, and I don't speak it very well. Um, when I go my PPR, I use the odd room, uh, the odd word, but I can't. I've never studied to do a proper PPR. Um, but this, um, this experiment we tried with the Tafari Tapafa created huge social capital in the team and massive vulnerability, which is always important, and it really united the group. And I'm forever thankful for Bunce coming on board because he was able to drive that. And he and I presented first, along with, I think, Ruby, Ruahe and Kendra Coxage, and Wes Clark, we were the first ones to present. And then, you know, we fitted girls in all right through the season. There were some traumatic ones. Um, there were some funny ones. Um, but through it all, there was a lot of support, a lot of tears, um, but a real understanding of who we were and everyone knowing each other. And I think it was a massive part of us doing what we did at that World Cup. 
The, this story is so epic. Uh, the whole coaching journey, which we've spoken about, sort of culminated in this, using all of the experience you've gathered along the way. It's like 159 days to turn this thing around and you end up winning it. The story's been well documented. But when you're going in there and you're meeting the team and you've got fresh eyes on them, like how are you establishing leaders Like straight away? Are you throwing out the knowledge that's been passed on? Are you just going in with a fresh approach? Um... <laughs> Well, having people like Wes and Whitney as my assist- co-coaches, I call them, not assistants, um, they knew the players. I didn't know the players. Um, an example of how we operated, so at um, the end of that first week, we had a game planned against the Lincoln Academy boys. I wanted to play boys and men all the way through to really challenge ourselves and we were getting a bit of a hiding but we were practicing all week a new game plan which was all out attack and it was about learning from each play so that we could attack the right space next time and offloads supporting an offload is different to supporting a ruck and you've it takes a long time to teach cue recognition beyond the ball is the offload going to be on here no nah. Is she going to pop off the ground? Maybe change lines for that. No, she's not. Now I've got to clean. And that's quite a sophisticated thing to do, and you can't teach it quickly, but you've got to start somewhere. So anyway, we, the fourth quarter of our match against Lincoln, um, I went out to listen to what the girls were saying, and this woman called Ruahe de Mont was put on to play in the last quarter. And she spoke... And she spoke eloquently to the team um, about what the F are you doing, girls? Well, we spent all week practicing the stuff that Smithy wants us to use, and you're using none of them. Where's your courage? And that fourth quarter was good. It was brilliant. I was able to cut some clips from it and say, you know, now we're cooking with gas if we can play like this. So it gave us some light. But I went back to the bench and asked the other two, so who was that girl who was speaking? They said, oh, it's Ruhe de Mont. Is she a Black Fern? Yep, she played for the Black Ferns. Um, I don't know if she'd been a first choice player or anything. This is what they said. And um, I said, well, she's going to be our captain for a start. That's mm. my first thing. She's going to be our captain. Yeah. And I go, what? <laughs> Wayne, <whoa. laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes you just get that, that feeling for it. And then... Um, it soon became obvious that some of the older leaders weren't, weren't going to make it, which was hard. It's hard for them, hard for me, um, telling them that. Um, but it was a reality. We've got so many young women coming through the game and so many exceptional women. We had about 55, I reckon, that could have played at the World Cup. And so it made it difficult. And we had to be really sharp with who we wanted I still remember Ruby ringing me um, one day and saying, you want to see this, you want to see this 18 year old girl in Auckland plays midfield. Um, I said, what's her name? Sylvia Brunt. You've got to have a look at her smithy like, she's phenomenal. So just things like that, you know, started learning about different women around the country, giving them opportunity. We gave everyone opportunity. Um, During the pack four, we played the whole squad. They all got a chance. Um, Then we had a trial. Then we had a, um, a Riley test over in Aussie again. We gave everyone a chance. Um, and I'd always said to them, We're not, the coaches aren't going to pick the team, you pick the team with your performance. And it'll become obvious through the year um, who, can, who can do it and who we're going to take the World Cup. So um, that's the way we operated. And, yeah, we, um, we ended up with a phenomenal group of women as I said before, they give to community, um, they're excited. Um, you'd hop on a bus coming home from training and someone would get up and say, oh, we were shit today, girls, doing that. Um, half past seven up in the team room, we're on Smithy's tactical mat, coaches will come, but we hardly had to say anything. Mm. You know, they'd, you want them teaching each other. Um, you, you, you know, as, as a leader, you need to keep thinking is what I'm doing helping these people flourish? You know, are they, are they responsible for their own learning? And that's the way 
that we were coaching and the girls just adapted to it. They were awesome. And so they'd fix things up upstairs. Next day they'd be a bit more prepared again and we just we continued that on for the whole campaign and we just got better at what we were doing. The, the biggest mistake I made was that we, that we worked so much on identifying the attacking possibilities or the, and, or the opportunities in every situation that we failed to understand how to close out a game, mm. <laughs> as you saw. <laughs> yeah, gone too far. <laughs> um, but you just couldn't move the girls. I remember um, when we played Japan just prior to the tournament, Eden Park, there was a big wind coming down the field. And before the toss, I went out, tested the wind, came and saw Ruahei and said, um, look, big wind coming down the field, just check the app, it's going to stop at about half time. I think we should take it if you win the toss. She looked at me like I was mad. She said, hell no, Smithy, if, if we win the toss, we want them to kick us a ball so we're going to attack. <laughs> so I gave her a big, gave her a big hug and said, that's my girl. <laughs> that a uh, but that's the attitude that we're creating because we knew that's the only way we're going to win. Yeah. But to play that game, you've got to have an exceptional skill level, be able to pass close to the opposition, um, no tick in the pass because you haven't got time, um, pass off either foot, um, you need the support play to be excellent. You know? And so we had to teach all these all these um, skills and the women would take over so at the start of training they'd do their own warm up for 20 minutes and a leader would whistle and right now we're going to do the um, box support drill or now we're going to do the knife through butter drill or whatever and they took over a lot of the a lot of the activities so that we could when we got into training we could just go hard at you know um, at the game rather than having to me having to run all the um, skill drills again. It's it's just the most perfect story with the most perfect ending. But how much do you think about those small margins, those like sliding door moments, right? That kick goes over in the semi final by France, and then we don't have this epic story. Yeah. Like that was a, a makeable kick that she should have made, and then we don't get all of the goodness that's come to New Zealand rugby yeah. afterwards. And the, you know, like, do you think about that stuff? Yes, and also the luck of the of the red card. I mean that. The instant it was a red card, but um, that then creates an opportunity for you against England, you know, and um, we all know how powerful they were. Uh, that gave us an, uh, an extra opportunity, I think. So th there's a bit of luck there. The missed kick was lucky, but we had opportunities in both those games to seal the win. So we had a, um, we had a penalty down in the French half um, late in that game could have kicked for touch. Our line-out drive was going pretty well. We, we probably even could have scored from that. But instead we tapped and went. Mm. My fault because um, we had this call, find it. So every opportunity, if, if we had a penalty and the other team got slack and started walking back to where they knew, thought the, the kick was going to go out, then we'd call find it and we'd just attack. Um, but it probably wasn't appropriate with <laughs> four minutes to go in the semi-final. And the same in the final. Um, so Ruahei lined up that. So we had the penalty, our 10 metre line. She probably would have kicked down the 22, our line out throw. England probably not going to score from there. It's certainly not going to... They can drive, but they can't... Not even they can drive that far. And so um, we thought the game was over there as Ruahei lined up. And Kendra Coxedge called find it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you elbowing your assistance at that point in the box? The magnificent Kendra Coxedge, I must say, she's a she's she's a fantastic she was, athlete. Tough. She was a she was a great guest on the yeah, podcast as well. Oh, she, she's brilliant. And yeah, and so what played out played out. How did, how's Wayne Smith celebrate that 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 finish was? edge of your seat gripping, uh, you get the win. Like, does emotion pour out of you at that point? Yeah, um, it was pretty like, I can't say we were, I was that composed in the box because I was screaming at Crono <laughs> to get someone up in the line out, get Jonah up, but he didn't have his ear plug in. <laughs> so he couldn't hear me. Whitney, who was a bit more composed than me, she got hold of, um, Renee Wycliffe who was running the water and said Pago get out there and just make sure Jonah goes up 
but Jaina had it sussed. You talk to Jane, she had it sussed. She's, she's a very smart woman. She knew what the cues were. We knew what the cues were, the line out, but we were struggling to pick them, but she picked it. Abby Ward, slight, slight nod. Um, she yelled at Crystal Murray to lift her. I think it was either Alana or Chelsea, bring her to, as a back lifter. And she was screaming at them to lift her and the rest's history. Yeah. Uh, um, and then afterwards, yeah, it's, um, I suppose that one, because when I started, it was unexpected. You know, I made brave statements about we're going to win it, Eden Park in front of 40,000, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen, you know, and, and a part of you feels, well, it's a long way to go. It's a long, you know, we've got to make a lot of improvements before we can do that. And then for it to happen, it's sort of become surreal. At that stage of your career as well, for it to happen, this, this opportunity which you never could have seen coming and then to do it on short notice and win. And I mean, I know you're still working now, but it kind of was the sort of the, what, the icing on the cake, the cherry on top. Yeah, yeah. Like I thought I, I could give the coaches a bit of advice <laughs> <laughs> during the year. <laughs> I, I never thought I was going to be the head coach and running everything and we had a very disparate sort of group of um, people on the staff that had come from all over the place and initially we weren't a high performing group at all um, but we became that uh, intelligent people in all the roles who grew to understand what we were trying to do and ultimately loved what we were doing whereas at the start they'd been They'd been coloured as well by the mental health report. Um, they were pretty shattered. But it was just great to see these people all come together. And one, a couple of examples. So um, I've, I've worked with players in a dojo since the Crusaders in 97 because I believe you've got a condition for combat. Oh, it's a tough, tough sport and you've got a condition for that with full contact, but you've got to do it in a safe environment. So when I started it with the women, there was very much a shock horror reaction from the staff. Holy hell, we're not going to have anyone left for the tournament. And my argument was always the opposite. No, it's, we're going to have more people available because we're learning safe techniques. Safe, safest techniques are always the most effective as well. People think, oh, if you teach, teach safety, you're not going to be competitive. Teach safety, you're going to be more competitive because like chin up and eyes open allow you to see the opportunity or his head down smashing into contact doesn't so um, we were teaching these things and I think most of us just about all the staff would say now if you interviewed them one of the key things at that World Cup was a dojo because we never got any any contact injuries Sorry for the ignorance is a, is a dojo a metaphor or are you actually going into actually in dojo wow yeah get the padded walls um, what metaphor did you think it was? <laughs> Well, like coaching, coaching deals in metaphor, like you're going, to, going into battle. You're not actually going into battle, but you know what I mean. There's a, uh, there are horrified looks on the faces when we started from the girls, mm. but man, they, they did it as hard as any men's team I've had. In fact, we got um, Adrian Choten when we were at a dojo in North Harbour, and you know, he's, I love the way he plays it as a seven, and he's great making decisions over the ball. So I got him in to... Um, helped the girls with a bit of cue recognition. And I think he was stunned <laughs> at the intensity of the combat. And we'd do an hour with the backs. Forwards would be doing weights and then they'd swap around. And of course, one group would try to be better than the other group. And so whilst it looked violent, it was, it was a really, I think, um, influential part of us being ready for those big games. So that was important. Um, and, yeah, and as I say, the, the staff in, in general bought into everything. We had club nights on a Tuesday night. Our girls love a club. You know, they love their club. They love a club night. A few beers and a bit of fun. We didn't have time to do it after games, so we'd have it on Tuesday night. They'd wear the club jerseys. We had a club captain, Asia. Letty Linger was the club captain. We got her a blazer, pink blazer from an op shop and... We all brought badges along, you know how yeah, yeah. Yeah, club captain has yeah. badges on, and then she ran the show on a Tuesday night, and we'd, we had a 
through the whole campaign, we ran a competition called Power Wars. So we had mini teams and you got points for winning competitions. So we'd have competitions at club night. Still going at the Chiefs, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And um, we'd, we'd have competitions at, on the field. Um, everything we did was competitive. And so initially too, that was sort of frowned on a wee bit, I think, by the staff because I'd allow them to have a beer if they wanted a beer. And... Um, or red wine, we had food trucks often, um, but it was superb at getting laughter, you know, and you've mm. got you to enjoy it. Mm. We had a lot of laughter, and after a Monday and a Tuesday of hard work, Tuesday night's a great time to, to relax, and then you've got the next day to, to ignite yourself for the Thursday, Friday, and then the, and then the game. Yeah. So it worked out pretty well, but yeah, it wasn't, wasn't wholly accepted at the start. I'd say the whole careers worked out pretty well, <laughs> Wayne. Um, we're, we're sort of getting to the end now, but you're, uh, you're still involved, high-performance mentor. So we talked about, is that individual mentoring? Or, like, what, what do you do in, at the moment? Well, I'm not too sure. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I talked to Bunce and I say, when would you like me to come in? And he'll say, oh, can you come in for a couple of days down at camp? So I'll go in and I work with Mike Delaney, Oh, um, Mully, what a guy. Yeah, Mully's here. Um, Tony Christie, two really great young coaches, open open to learning, um, just want information, you know, want to get better. Steve Jackson, um, who was head coach of North Harbour, he's coaching the forwards, and, of course, Bunce in there, and um, Craig Twentyman, the, the um, strength, and, strength and conditioning coach that we had. So um, I love it. I love going in and looking at training, giving some ideas at a coaching meeting. They can take them or leave them, but, you know, we have some good discussions. And with Razor, I'm not sure what that's going to look like. So we haven't, we haven't met yet. We're in contact um, on WhatsApp. He's coming up in a couple of weeks for a chat. Can I just ask a quick question? Does he sign off his messages to you with a little Razor emoji? <laughs> Or is that um, just for people he doesn't know? <laughs> he doesn't with me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen got the yeah, razor emoji on. Tried to get him on the podcast, and he sent back and he had a little razor emoji at the end. I, I, thought was I wasn't nice. sure. Does that mean you cut? Yeah, maybe. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I assume so. He hasn't yeah, responded. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we go back a long way. Obviously, coached him in Crusaders. Know him well. Um, looking forward to that. Looking forward to being able to um, exchange ideas. You know, I know that um, he'll listen and he'll take what he wants and leave out what he doesn't want, and that's fine. That's the role of an advisor. So I don't know what it, exactly what it'll look like, um, but we'll work that out along the way. Is the Women's World Cup a full stop on the head coaching career? Well, you never say never, um, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed getting back on the field. Oh, I'm a head coach that coaches. I don't like, I couldn't stand just um, other people doing, doing what I want to be out there. I want to influence the game through coaching on the field. Um, yeah, whether, whether I'll either do, do that again, I'm not sure. But um, I say I'm retired, but I'm not really. I'm sort of semi-retired with um, often a thought of maybe I'll get back into it. But you never know. You Probably won't. But. One, one more, and I, I kind of picked it up along. You've got analysts at your disposal. Do you do your own clips still, though? Yeah. Yeah, I do my own clips. So you get, um, you get your coding done through sports code, and you've got analysts that code extra stuff. It's, it's very sophisticated. You know, we have KPIs that measure different things. I, I really like um, the unsung hero KPIs, you know, because... Your result is is deeply attached to your effort, and so getting off the ground quickly, getting into position quickly, being efficient with your movements, um, supporting the ball carrier, everyone coming forward and attack, all those things win your championships. So I tend to code in those areas and get charts, set up charts that that show players' effort and mini units' efforts, and often often compare them with the opposition mini unit, you know, to, to, to show did we, did we out-effort them or not. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah um, 
you get a lot of help, there's a lot of information, but I still like to code areas that I'm responsible for. And it's a good way to cut your clips for your group that's going to present afterwards. And do you like the nickname of the professor? Well, I like it better than the mad professor, which is what they thought I was when I started with Crusaders. <laughs> They're pretty pleased they got rid of the mad. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I don't think too much about it. <laughs> um, and last one for me, you're now a published author. So have you got the, um, by the time this goes out, the book will be in stores? You, all, all leading bookstores will be selling it? You got the sales pitch ready yeah, to go? Yeah, it's a bit of a overstatement to say I'm, I'm, a, I'm an author. It was um, Phil Gifford's idea. He, he's a pest, actually, because he, <laughs> he'd ring every three, like probably six years, he rang every three months um, to say, you're ready to do that book? I'd go, nah, not interested. Jan, and his wife, would get him to ring me on my birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Smithy. Um, look, can I come up and maybe we have a chat about the book? Nah, not interested. Finally, he wore me down. My mum, who's 92 and still living in Pataru with my sister and brother in law, she planned the idea it'd be quite good for me to write a book that she could read before she, before she departs. Mm. So I started thinking about it, yeah, um, maybe I'll do it. But he's put it together. I just did the interviews. Okay. And it was a hell of a big job. He had 40 hours of transcripts. And then I'm sending him stuff as well. We were over in Europe. Um, while he was putting it together, he was sending me um, what he'd written. I'd put some more stuff in or edit it. But a lot of things got mixed up from my end. And in the end, I couldn't remember if I'd sent him stories or not. Yeah. And so as a, I w I'm hoping to bring out a second edition next year and add in some stories. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> because uh, I've got Don't a lot of mates. We'll edit that bit out. I've got a, <laughs> I've got a lot of mates are going to be ringing me going, you didn't even mention me in your book. Yeah. I'll go, well, I had a story on you, but I don't know where it is, but I'll, yeah. yeah. So I've got, a bit, uh, I've got a few relationships to fix up, I think, after this comes out. <laughs> There's been a few nice teasers in this app, so go and check it out. I'm sure it'll be an amazing read. It's been such a, a pleasure and an honour, actually, just um, going through your life and career. So... Thank you so much for coming in and giving us so much of your time. Um, I've learned a lot from it. I know the audience will too, but Shay? Yeah, your dedication, I think, to your craft has been evident through this conversation. And it's no wonder that you're the only person to have won a Men's World Cup and a Women's World Cup. The amount of time and effort and care that you put into the sport of rugby particularly um, is incredible. You're well deserving of your knighthood. Um, and I think it's amazing that you're so willing to share that knowledge with other people, not just in rugby, but in other sports as well. So thank you very much for sharing some time with us and sharing some of those insights and um, look forward to reading that book. Oh, it's, no, it's been a real pleasure. Um, thanks to everyone who's watching and you guys. Outstanding. I can see why you're number one. Um, it was really enjoyable. I'm just worried now about my car because I'll probably get a $150 fine for overparking. <laughs> we'll pick it up, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cheers, Wayne. Okay, thanks, guys.